So we're back with chapter 20, Baxter Park. Puny had set the ironing board up in his bedroom so she could press the drapes that had been folded over a hanger for two years. Dooley had promised to help her hang them in the afternoon. I've seen that big mess in the churchyard, she said. What is all that stuff anyway? Bells. Bells under a tarp, delivered without warning, and nobody to put them in the tower till next Wednesday. I thought Emma was getting married Saturday. That don't look too good with a wedding going on. No kidding. He was going through his pants pocket and making a pile for the dry cleaning truck. That ham you got is a whopper. You want me to bake it Friday? I'd be beholden to you if you would. I'll use my pineapple glaze at Jojo. I mean, uh, oh, well, she flushed beet red. Jojo, is it? Shoot, she said. I didn't mean to let that out. And why not? Have you forgotten who prayed for a parade out of the goodness of his heart? He was so pleased with her unintentional confession that he could scarcely contain his smug delight. I don't think it's right to talk about things like that till you know what's going on with somebody. That's what Mama said. She courted our daddy a whole year before she talked about it. Frowning, she pulled the heavy lined drapery panel off the ironing board. I wish you'd help me put this thing over the chair back. It weighs a ton. I've never understood exactly how you keep something like that under cover, he said. He took one end and helped her spread it over the other panels. Oh, come now, she said, look, winking hugely at him. You do know, too. I mean, look at you. What do you mean, look at me? I mean, your neighbor is what I mean. Ha ha. Ha ha yourself, he said, feeling the color steal into his face. Somebody said... Y'all were walking out, were out walking the other night, right on Main Street. Walking on Main Street is hardly keeping anything under cover. Can't two people go for a stroll without causing tongues to wag? Puny laughed. Tongue wagging's about the only action y'all get over here in Mitford. Now, now, don't be pulling any, any of your Wesley high hat on me, young lady. Anyway, I think she's real cute. I like her. She's different. I agree. With what? That she's real cute or that she's different? Puny's eyes gleamed with mischief. I sincerely hope that you don't persecute Jojo this way, he said, finding two quarters and a dime in a pants pocket. And speaking of parades, did you find, do you find Jojo to be a drum and bugle corps, a marching band, or the fire engines? Jojo, she said rapturously, is the Santa Claus at the end, with a big sack of presents throwing candy to the kids. He was on his hands and knees, searching under the dresser for the dime that rolled across the floor. That's as lavish a compliment as I've ever heard, I believe. He's nice, he got, he's got manners, and he's got a jaw, not to mention good-looking. He stood up, smiling at her. I agree with all that, and then some. You have my blessing without even asking for it. And you, she said, grinning, have mine. Father, said the caller, Pete Jameson. Pete, I'm glad to hear your voice. Just wanted to call and check in. I'm in St. Paul. How are you? Good. Can't complain. Do you? Not bad. They just gave me an award for the most sales in the first quarter. Considering that this time last year I had the fewest sales. Pete, congratulations. You can't know how I like hearing that. Well, Father, you probably won't like hearing this. You know the four things you told me to do when I left that day? Pray, read your Bible, be baptized, go to church. Well, I'm going to church, but I've got to tell you that it's full of hypocrites. Father Tim laughed. If there was ever a popular refrain in modern Christendom, that might be it. My friend, if you keep your eyes on Christians, you will be disappointed every day of your life. Your hope is to keep your eyes on Christ. Yes, well, I will disappoint you, Pete. They will disappoint you, but he will never disappoint you. I was about to say, heck with it. Don't quit. Are you reading your Bible? Uh, well, I was. And then you quit. You got it. Then you can expect to be weak on one of your flanks, and that's precisely where the enemy will come after you with a vengeance. I hear you. When are you coming back this way? Soon, I hope. My territory is so big it's stretching me like a rubber band. Keep your faith and you won't snap, said the rector, as Harold Newland walked in with the morning mail and handed him the day's packet. Excuse me, Pete. Thank you, Harold. See you Saturday. Harold blushed deeply. Right on top, a letter from the man in the attic with the return address of a federal prison. Pete, said Father Tim, do you have a brother? No, sir. Always wanted one, though. You've got one now. Let me tell you a story. Well, 
Dooley said, slamming his book bag on the kitchen counter. That's that. That's what? During school's out. Of course, I'd clean forgotten. I told Tommy he could spend the night tonight. We were going to talk about that first. Why did you invite him without talking about it first? I forgot. Forgot. Well, and so had he. After all these weeks of lamely trying to figure out what to do with, about Dooley when school was out, he'd completely forgotten that this very day it was out, period. And here he sat reading the Anglican Digest. It was enough to make him squirm with guilt if he'd been so minded. Didn't everybody else have something clearly mapped out for their charges for the summer? Positive things like jobs and earning money and opening savings accounts and sticking to a reading program and maybe going to camp. Camp? He was astounded that the most obvious thing of all had only at this moment occurred to him. Would he never get this right? Put your things away and we'll have a snack. Then we'll walk up and see your grandfather and take him his liver mush. He heard Dooley bound up the stairs. His face had not shown it, but surely he must be nearly ecstatic with his new freedom. He remembered some of his own ecstasy at the letting out of school, and yes, it had to do with friends. Certainly Tommy could come. Friends, however, could not solve the entire problem of what to do with the summer. For him, those years ago in, in Holly Springs, there had always been something to look forward to. A project, perhaps. Something definite. He picked up the phone. Dora, he said to his friend of the hardware, Got any rabbits on hand? He had brought home the cage containing one sleek, curious black and white Flemish giant and put it on the back porch stoop when the phone rang. Father, said Miss Sadie, I've been thinking. School was out yesterday and I was wondering if Dooley would like a job for the summer. You know there's lots to do at this old place. Miss Sadie, he said, let me talk to him about that. I may put him to work in the church gardens. When he saw Cynthia at the local, they stopped to visit by the produce bins. She'd been asked to read from her books at the library as part of a summer cultural program and was radiant at the prospect. Before they went along their separate aisles, she said, I've been thinking. My basement could use a good clean-up. Do you think Dooley would be interested? And we could dig some flower beds in the back. Uncle left it a jungle out there. Oh, and maybe the two of us could build a rabbit hutch. I'd pay him, of course, and teach him to watercolor. Watercolor? Dooley? Well, and why not? Why not indeed? Later, Hal Owen dropped by the rectory. Came to town to pick up a package of serum. Hadn't seen you in a while since we've been skipping the coffee hour. How are you, Tim? Not bad, considering. Considering what? Considering that I have a boy who needs proper guidance, wisdom, direction, instruction, discipline, and last but not least, something to do for the summer. That's why I came, said Hal, grinning and taking out his pipe. We thought you might let Uncle Duell spend a few weeks at Meadowgate. When the rector walked back to the hardware to pick up the rabbit food he'd left sitting on the counter, he ran into Dooley's teacher. Miss Powell, how did we do this here? I've seen some positive changes in Dooley, she said, smiling, but he has a way to go. And uh, which way do you think he might be going? Oh, I clearly see an outstanding ability in math if you'll help him stick with it. He also proved to be a pretty tough slugger on the ball field. And then there's his singing. Singing? Why, yes. We coaxed him into mixed chorus a few weeks ago. I've been meaning to tell you that. He has a marvellous voice and great timing. It may be a gift. Dooley's singing. How extraordinary. Jenna, he said, calling his Sunday school supervisor at home. Have we ever thought of forming a young people's choir? Well, we've thought of it, but somehow it just hasn't happened. Would you be kind enough to make it happen? He asked. He saw Barnabas at the opposite end of the field, running toward him. Come on, boy, he yelled. Come on, fella. But though Barnabas ran and ran, he remained at the opposite end of the field. He tried to run himself to the great black barking dog, but felt as if he were trapped waist high in Mississippi mud. In an agony of frustrated longing, he exerted a shuddering effort that seemed to force his very heart to burst. When he awoke, bathed in sweat, Dooley was standing over his bed, looking stricken. Why'd you go to hollering for an old, for an old dog? That old dog's gone, he said severely. That old dog is not gone, he exclaimed with sudden anger. You like to scare the poop out of me? The poop is precisely what you need to have scared out of you, he declared, unbuttoning his pajama top. He hated those dreams in which he found himself bound like a mummy, unable to move, his heart pounding like a hammer. Go back to bed, he told the boy, who was still trying to peer into his face. I ain't till you quit hollering. I've quit, for heaven's sake. Haven't you ever had a nightmare? 
I've had plenty of them old things, said the boy, climbing into bed with him. Well, then you understand. He lay back against the pillows and glanced at the clock. 4 a.m. I had one of them dreams the other night at the farm. I was dreaming my little brother Kenny had fell in the creek and turned into a fish, and I was running after him along the bank hollering, Kenny, Kenny, come back, don't be a fish, don't leave me. And Miss Owen said I woke up Rebecca Jane, but that was all right. She'd come in and talk to me. Do you miss your brother? Yeah, he was my best friend. Dear God, five children wrenched apart like a litter of cats or dogs. Tell me about your brothers and sisters. There's Jessie, she's the baby, still pooping in her britches, and Sammy, he's five, he stutters. Then there's old Poobah. What does Poobah mean? Means he took after a pool ball my, mom, my mama brought home, had an eight on it. She said it was a keepsake. Poobah hauled that old thing round, went to sleeping with it, and that's where his name come from. He used to be Henry. What's Henry like? What's his bed? He's seven. He dreaded this. Do you know where they are? Mama said she'd never tell nobody, or the state would come get him. I was the last one to go. There was a long silence. If it wrenched his own heart to hear this, how must Dooley's heart be faring? Have you ever prayed for your brothers and your baby sister? Nope. Prayer is a way to stay close to them. You can't see them, but you can pray for them, and God will hear that prayer. It's the best thing you can do for them right now. How do you do it? You just jump in and do it. Something like this. You can say it with me. Our Father. Our Father. Be with my brother Kenny and help him. Be with my brother Kenny and help him. To be strong, to be brave, to love you and love me. To be strong, to be brave, to love you and love me, no matter what the circumstances. No matter what the circumstances, and please God, and please God, be with those whose names Dooley will bring to you right now. He heard something hard and determined in the boy's voice. Mama, Grandpa, Jesse and Sammy and Poobah, Miss Ivy at church and Tommy, that old dog, a rabbit. Miss Coppersmith and old Violet and all. He buried his face in the pillow and pulled it around his ears. The clock ticked. Somewhere through the open alcove window, he heard the rooster crow, the rooster whose whereabouts he couldn't identify, but whose call often gave him a certain poignant joy. Dooley moved closer to him, and in minutes he heard a light, whiffling snore. He sat up and pulled the blanket over the boy's sleeping form. He didn't know why he felt this would be a splendid summer for Dooley Barlow. When his neighbor came over to see the new rabbit, they sat on the top step of the back stoop. The air was warm and balmy, and a light breeze stirred in the trees. Thanks for coming to the library to hear me, she said. What makes you think I came to hear you? Didn't you see that I was there to read the journal? Ha, she said. You never turned a single page, he laughed. Is that a fact? It is, and you know it. Then while we're into this thanking business, let me say that I appreciate it when you come to hear me and give the Presbyterians the nod. My pleasure, she said, looking directly into his eyes and smiling. I suppose I need to be making a decision soon about where to join. It would be a blessing to look out and see your face. Dooley came through the back door, slamming the screen behind him. Hey, he said to Cynthia. Hey, yourself. There ain't no lettuce nor any carrots nor nothing in, yet, in there. The rector pulled the $10 bill out of, his, out of his wallet. Go see Avis and load up. Cynthia looked after the red bicycle as it disappeared around the corner of the rectory. Can't we do something about his English? Or his negative attitude? Or his table manners? Or his murderous temper? Or his pain? There are so many things to do something about. Overwhelming, is it? Very. Let me encourage you, Timothy. I think you've done wonders with him. Combed his cowlick, bought him some tennis shoes. It's hard to believe I've done any more than that, really. Trust is the foundational problem. He trusts no one. Jenna's doing a good job with him in Sunday school. He's getting some of the basics. I'm just waiting to see where to go from here. What about the summer? Overnight, he has a full dance card. I feel the best thing is to send him to Medigate for three or four weeks. There's a lot of love for him out there, and farm life will do him good. Then I'll bring him home to work with me in the church gardens and try to get your basement cleaned up. As for your flower beds, I can dig those. I've been digging beds for 20 years, so my credentials are solid. Excuse me. It was the girl who had come looking for Dooley once before. Is Dooley home? You've just missed him, said the rector. But he'll be back in a flash. Why don't you stay and wait for him? Thank you, she said softly. Cynthia patted the step next to her. Come, sit on the steps with us. I've just popped over to see the new rabbit. 
I like rabbits, the girl said, sitting down. She was wearing a sleeveless dress that bared her brown arms, and her blonde hair was in French braids. A pretty girl who looked straight out of a Nordic fairy tale, observed the rector. What's your name? Cynthia wanted to know. Jenny, see that red roof over there? That's my house. Another neighbor and another pair of luminous eyes. I'm Cynthia, and this is Father Tim. Pleased to meet you, she said. What's the bunny's name? Cynthia laughed. I wanted to name him Clarence, but they won't listen to me. Can't you just see him with a little pair of horn-rimmed glasses and tweed knickers? Anyway, he doesn't have a name yet. As soon as Dooley gets back, we're going to give him one. I have two bunnies. Do they have names? Flopsy and Mopsy. It was a busy day, and I didn't have the wits to be original. This one could be Cottontail. It could, said Cynthia, but I don't think they'll go for it. When the red bicycle tore around the side of the rectory, Dooley, who was carrying a grocery bag in one arm and steering with the other, looked with amazement at the visitor and, without slowing down, crashed headlong into the sycamore tree. The bells continued to sit under a tarp on the lawn at Lord's Chapel, though he tried almost daily to get the crew to install them. They were all working, it seemed, on the golf resort in Wesley. Putting golf before God, he said to Ron Malcolm. Now there's a sermon title, and I ought to be man enough to preach it. The earliest they could get to it, they said, was Friday, June 28th. They'd get right on it at 8 a.m., and by noon the bell should be chiming. He noted the date on his calendar. June 28th. Why did that have a familiar ring? No pun intended. He wouldn't put more roses in his own garden this year, but he would certainly put a new bed in the church gardens. He had ordered the memorial plaque from a catalogue, and he was pleased with the bold Gothic lettering. The Souvenir de la Malmaison, with its five-inch pink blooms, had been named in honour of the Empress Josephine's famous gardens, and he had been intimidated by, for years by its reputation for being difficult and hard to establish. Well then, no use to hold back any longer, he told himself. It's now or never. He also ordered several Madame Azek Isaac Perrier, reputed to be far less temperamental, to climb up the east wall. Even more aromatic than Malmaison, they were said to smell like crushed raspberries. What an extraordinary thing arose. He was beginning to feel some inspiration for his talk at the festival. You ought to make that hole bigger, said Dooley, who was helping him to install the roses before he went off to mitigate. That hole ain't near big enough. How do you know it isn't? I just know is all. When they were putting the rotted manure in the holes, the rector realized he'd forgotten to bring a second pair of gloves. I ain't scared of no cow poop, said the boy, working it deftly into the soil with his hands. Good fellow. And what did Jenny have to say the other day? Said she was sorry I got in trouble for knocking Buster Austin's lights out. Said he was asking for it. He's always going around asking for it. Yes, but you always have to be the one to give him what he asks for. I ain't going to no more. Thanks be to God. And why is that? Because, because why, may I ask? Dooley took a deep breath. There was a long silence and then he spoke carefully. Just because, he said. Here's the deal, said Walter, who called before the evening news. Catherine and I have it all worked out. We'll meet you at the Shannon Airport on July 21st. We'll take a bus to the train in Limerick City and go up to Sligo, where we stay three weeks in a marvellous old farmhouse near Low Gill. Then we take a car down to Clare Morris and Rose Common, perhaps all the way to, Balling to Ballingslow. Margaret says we'll find a few uh, family archives at an abbey in Ballingslow. But you know how she varnishes the plain truth. There's no way under heaven I can do this now. There are too many. Timothy, for God's sake, you've been making excuses about this trip for 15 years. Come now, old fella. If you wait until you have time, you'll never set foot outside Midford. That's true. I agree with you completely. Then let's do it. Catherine and I could go on our own, of course, but we'd much rather go with you in tow. You know how we've talked about splitting up in three directions during the day to pursue the family secrets, then coming together e every evening at dinner to put it all in one pot. What ground we could cover. It would be an experience of a lifetime, following those crooked turns back to our ancestral castle. Timothy, this is the year for it. Trust me on this. Walter, I have a boy you now, you know with a long summer stretching ahead of him like a jet runway. He needs someone to hold down the fort, and his grandfather recovering from pneumonia, and a Persianer who's waiting for a heart transplant, and a $5 million nursing home on the drawing board. What's more, I just put in a dozen vastly expensive roses, which we'll need looking after. You must understand, I simply can't do it. Perhaps next year. 
Cousin, you deceive yourself. There will always be a boy in a nursing home in a case of pneumonia, in a manner of speaking. He noticed that Walter sounded genuinely disappointed. I despise saying no again and again to this wonderful dream. His voice trailed off. He was miserably disappointed in his own everlasting inability to get up and go, to take strong action and seize control, and do all the things that other people seemed able to do, and which the world admired so much. There were times when he felt the Ireland trip was the most possible thing in life, and his heart would lift up and he'd begin to plan and read and even daydream about it. Then suddenly it seemed ridiculously impossible, a trivial pursuit in a world of so much suffering and pain. It was vain to go gadding after one's thoroughly dead ancestors in a vague ruin of a castle. And another thing, he said, having a sudden revival of energy. Barnabas is missing, and if that $2,500 reward works, and a lot of people think it will, who would be here to welcome him back? There. That was something Walter could not knock down in the least. Well, of course, his cousin said reasonably. You're right. Catherine will be disappointed, but perhaps we'll screw up our enthusiasm and go anyway, just the two of us. We'll bring the research home and see what you can make of it. Yes, he said, immeasurably relieved. That's a terrific idea. You do the footwork, I'll pour over the papers and the dates and try to make sense of everything. And then perhaps we could all go later and fill in the holes. Why did he have to say that? He could never leave well enough alone. On June 13th, remembering the date at the top of Willard Porter's letter, he took Miss Sadie a birthday card. The walk up the hill warmed him considerably, and he wished for his running clothes, which he hadn't donned in weeks. He must call Hoppy, but fervently disliked telling the truth about ne the neglect of his exercise and diet program. He had done so well for so long, and then he had lost control. A few days of his medication here, a few taboo plate foods on his plate there, and the first thing he knew, he was again overweight, fatigued, low in spirit, and generally aggravated by the aggressive takeover agenda of his hateful disorder. When Luella offered him a piece of coconut birthday cake, he responded with such severity that she was taken aback. Sorry, Luella, I was snapping at myself, not at you. Please forgive me. Miss Sadie was breezing about the bedroom, rouging her cheeks and getting ready to drive to town with Luella to pick up Q-tips at the drugstore. I'm glad to see who got over being tired. Happy birthday, he kissed her forehead. May there be many more to come. I want all God can give me, she said brightly. Oh, and I'm thrilled to say that Olivia Davenport would love to have Mama's hats. But when I told her there were 32 of them, she was kind of shocked, I think. I'll see that's taken care of in the next few days. Now, what may I do for you on your birthday? I have a half hour or so. She thought she might like a piece of furniture moved, perhaps, or something carried to the basement. You've done more than enough already. More than enough. But if you could spare the time one day soon... I'd dearly love to know what's carved on that beam in Willard's attic. He had an odd sinking feeling when Dooley went to his room back from Meadowgate. He could feel it coming. The house already seemed forlorn. What had he done all those years with no dog and no boy, just the everlasting monotony of his own company? He supposed he hadn't noticed very much that he was alone, proving the old adage that you can't miss what you never had. He paced the floor of his study, thinking. It's only for three or four weeks. Imagine what you can get done around here with no interruptions, no bologna to fry, no hamburgers to fix, no jeans to wash, no homework to help with. He tried to imagine himself sitting with his feet up, reading Archbishop Carey's book, but somehow that didn't seem very interesting at all. He heard Dooley thumping down the stairs, dragging a suitcase that was evidently filled with lead. What are you taking in that thing, anyway? Just some old poop for Wrecka Jane. And what might that be? Just a baseball and a dump truck and stuff like that. Hal will be here any minute. I pray you'll remember what we discussed. Say please and thank you. Don't cuss. Wash my hands. Don't sass Miss Owen. Change my underwear. Make my bed. That's all, ain't it? No, that ain't all, said the rector. And say my prayers? Right. Good fellow. And I'll call you twice a week and try to get out there before too long. He was astounded that he'd just heard himself say ain't, as if it were the most natural thing in the world. It was good that Dooley Barlow was going away for a while, as he'd begun talking exactly like him. He had been right, of course. The house seemed hollow as a gourd. He heard his footsteps echo dully in the hall. He took two carrots out of the refrigerator and walked to the garage. 
Well, Jack, he said, stooping down and putting the carrots in the rabbit cage. It's just you and me, old boy. He walked back to the study and looked at the clock on the mantel. 5.15. Maybe he should run. Puny hadn't come today, so maybe he'd walk to the local and get something for dinner. He felt ravenous as he'd skipped lunch, quite without meaning to. He'd started working on his sermon until 12.30, and then a phone had started ringing, and somehow the afternoon had slipped away and he'd come home to say goodbye to Dooley, and here he was, standing in the middle of the floor as bereft as if he'd lost his last friend. He gazed out on Baxter Park, half hidden from view behind the rhododendron hedge. The light had stolen softly across the wide open park, bordered on all sides by darkly green hedges. What a treasure, that park, and yet he never used it, nor even encouraged Dooley to go there. A perfect place to sit and read, to sit and think, to have a picnic. A picnic? He looked in the refrigerator and found four lemons and made a jar of lemonade. He found cold chicken and then a fine wedge of brie and French rolls. There were berries left from breakfast and Puny's banana bread that hadn't even been cut. He put it all into a picnic basket with damask napkins and fetched a starched tablecloth out of the bottom drawer of the buffet. He stopped suddenly and shook his head. Once again, he had put the cart before the horse. Cynthia, he said when she answered the phone, would you like to go on a picnic? He feared the worst. She was probably off to the country club, perhaps to a dinner dance with a full orchestra. You would? He had certainly not meant to sound so joyful. Cynthia sat on the tablecloth in her denim skirt and chambray blouse with a large napkin across her lap. She held her palms up. Surely it's not raining. No, indeed. That was dew off the leaves. We're not having rain. He poured the lemonade into crystal glasses. How happy he was with his idea, with an idea that was quite unlike his usual ideas. Perhaps he wasn't as thoroughly dull after all as he'd felt when talking with Walter. Cynthia, he said, raising his glass, here's to your next book and all your future books. To your illustrations, may they come alive on the page. To your happiness, to your health, and to your prosperity. They drank. My, she said, that was a toast and a half. Goodness. A picnic, Cynthia, think of it. How long has it been since you were on a picnic? Shall I tell you the truth? Of course, always. Yesterday. She said simply, he was fairly devastated to think he'd imagined he was clever and original and then to learn it was all merely humdrum and every day. Andrew Gregory, he supposed, feeling a slow drip on his pants from the perspiring glass. Violet and I found a mossy bank on Little Mitford Creek and had deviled eggs and popcorn and tuna on toast. He was so relieved he might have shouted, a roller coaster. Being with Cynthia was like being on a roller coaster. His feelings dipped and soared so uncontrollably. I sketched ladybugs and moss. It was wonderful. Violet slept in the sun and a butterfly lighted on her ear. Can you imagine? He could, but only with some effort. He leaned against the bench, with they'd, which they'd spread the cloth beside. Surely he reached the very gates of heaven, where he found a balmy breeze, a place far removed from the fret of getting and spending, and best of all, someone agreeable to talk with. They lingered in the twilight. Blue. They lingered on in the twilight the evening birdsong loud and vibrant in the hedges. He knew he would ask her sooner or later, but each time he thought of it, his heart pounded. Cynthia, he said at last, glad for the fading light, what does going steady mean exactly? Well, it's one of those wonderful things that means just what it says. You go with someone steadily, and you don't go out with anybody else. I already don't go out with anybody else. Yes, but I do, or did, or even might again. She tilted her head to one side, smiling. What's wrong with things as they are? He felt slightly annoyed. Things as they are are so unofficial. I never know when I might see you. It would be lovely to have something to look forward to with you, like going out to a movie or having you in for dinner more often. Just simple things. I don't understand why we have to go steady to do those things. Well, of course, we don't have to. It would just be nicer to know that Someone was special, set apart. He cleared his throat. You've been seeing Andrew Gregory, I believe. Andrew is lovely, really he is. Very gracious and lots of fun. But it's Churchill this and Churchill that, and I can't bear Churchill. He was horrid to his wife, rude to his guests, and cursed like a sailor. And every time he went to the club, I got a terrible knot in my stomach. I'm just not good at that sort of thing. Besides, he likes bridge, and I positively loathe it. She gazed at him intently. You are clearly the most interesting woman I've ever known. Do you really mean that? I do, 
You're easy to be with. You're thoughtful and amusing. You're enormously talented and, yes, very lovely to look at. There, he'd said everything. Why was this so difficult? She had, after all, asked a simple yes or no question. Would you like to go steady? Yet he felt as if he needed to write a full sermon in reply. The truth is, he said, I'm fearful of anything that might get might interfere with my with your work. Yes. Typical. What do you mean, typical? Men are always afraid that something might interfere with their work. Now she seemed annoyed. You could try looking at it as something to enhance your work, as a welcome diversion that may help you along in your work. A fresh way of looking at it, he thought, with some surprise. You know, the knot that comes with a party at the country club is mild to what I'm feeling right now. What are you feeling? So nervous I could throw up. I have never in my life argued for anything like this. It never occurred to me that a simple question would turn into a platonic debate. After all, Timothy, I did not ask you to marry me. She stood up suddenly, and he rose also, catching her arm. Please, don't be upset. It was a wonderful question. I should be flattered and grateful beyond words that you asked. I'm sorry. Without thinking, he put his arms around her and drew her close, entering that territory of wisteria, which infused even the faint warmth of her breath on his cheek. Her softness was a shock to him, to the place where he kept his heart orderly and guarded, and he realized it wasn't hammering at all. It was completely at peace. They heard it before they felt it. Rain, they cried in unison, and grabbing up the hamper and the cloth, fled across the park as it came down in a sudden torrent. The peace was still there, he thought, lying awake at three o'clock in the morning, listening to the murmur of the rain. It was a palpable thing, this feeling, undefiled by concern or doubt. He prayed for Cynthia, admiring her courage to speak up. Come boldly to the throne of grace, Paul had written to the Hebrews. He liked her boldness. He was filled with a certain excited expectation for the summer, as if his own school had been let up. It felt as if thunder were vibrating through the bed. Horrified, he sat up and saw lights flashing wildly around the room. In the sound that filled the air like another presence, he heard an odd, familiar, oddly familiar rhythm. Cut, 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 cut. He sprang out of bed and went to the alcove window, but could see nothing more than the flashing lights that seemed to be swinging rapidly in circles like a beacon. Without switching on the hall light, he raced down the stairs to the kitchen window. A helicopter in Baxter Park and people running, and there, just as the light flashed across it, Hoppy's blue Volvo. Good Lord, Olivia. He slipped his feet into his garden shoes by the door and ran toward the hedge and through it, blinded by the light and sickened by the deafening roar. He saw Hoppy and two others taking Olivia from the car. I'm here, he shouted, fighting the storm of feeling that rose in him. Pray, yelled Hoppy, who had lifted her in his arms. Olivia looked at him and reached out. He was able only to touch her fingertips as Hoppy rushed her to the helicopter door and handed her into waiting hands. Then the doctor climbed in, and the door closed. Someone backed the car across the park, deeply trenching the rain-soaked grass, and almost immediately the helicopter was lifting, lifting, was in the air, and vanishing over the tops of the trees. Philippians 4.13, for Pete's sake, he whispered hoarsely to the sudden darkness. What a horrid nightmare. What was it all about? Cynthia came through her hedge with a flashlight. It's Olivia. I don't know what the mission is. I pray to God she's flying to her heart. Flying to her heart. A miracle of miracles. Cynthia took his hand, dropping the flashlight by her side. It beamed on his feet. Oh dear, she said, looking down. He had lost one of his untied tennis shoes. The other was covered with mud. His pajama legs were soaked nearly to his knees. And Violet was nuzzling his ankle. He put his arms around Cynthia and held her. How good it was to hold someone, especially after the shock of that alarming mission in the park. So lovely. She murmured against his shoulder, stroking his cheek. Two dear hugs in one night. It's almost as good as... as going steady? Mm-hmm. He laughed a little. Almost, perhaps, but surely not quite. It was 4.30 in the morning when he fell to his knees by his bed and began to pray intensely. When he arose from the rug, creaking in his joints and assailed by a burning thirst, he was amazed to see it was six o'clock. All day he felt derailed cut loose from his moorings, the loss of sleep, the accumulating fatigue. Maybe it was his age, after all. He had forgotten call Hoppy, but that was just as well in view of things. He would see him next week without fail, assuming Hoppy had returned from wherever he'd gone. 
If he hadn't returned, he most assuredly did not want to see the new Dr. Wilson, who seemed wet behind the ears. In the office mailbox, a card from Emma. Having a wonderful time, do not wish you were here, ha ha. You should have seen Harold talking to Mickey Mouse. I got a whole roll of snaps. Much love, Emma. He dropped by the grill for a late breakfast, comforted by the familiar surroundings and Percy's dependable nosiness. I heard that copter sat down in the park last night. You'd like to scare Velma to death. Truth is, you look like you've been scared to death. You were, you were white as a sheet. I come in here to be cheered up, and instead I get brought down. Do I really look white as a sheet? Washed up, gray like, sickly. That's enough. Thank you very much. Don't mention it. He sat in the booth and buttered his toast. Just when he should be gaining a second wind, he was crashing and burning. It seemed a good time to write Stuart Cullen. Perhaps even a good time to go see him in person. But he hated the thought of the long drive. Perhaps he would take Cynthia along. There, a brilliant idea. She and Martha would get on famously, and wouldn't Stuart be fairly astounded? It's like this. He would explain. It's like what? Well, of course, he didn't know exactly, so he'd just let Stuart figure it out and then tell him. J.C. Hogan slipped into the booth with his bulging half open briefcase. When are you going to have a letter from the man in the attic? I need to fill up some space. Advertising's done dropped off. A letter from George Gaynor isn't exactly filler, but I just got a letter and you can have it next week. Too late. I'd like to get it today for Monday's paper. Let me finish my breakfast. I just came from the office, but I'll go back again. J.C. got up, jolting the table and nearly dumping the rector's breakfast in his lap. Just running upstairs while that, where I'll be laying out the center spread. I'll see to it, Father Tim said crisply. Coot Hendrick slipped into the booth, wearing a red cap from the hardware. I wish to God a feather could get him a plate of gizzards in this place. Gizzards, is it? I was raised on gizzards. Like them better than white meat. You won't be getting no gizzard plate around here, yelled Percy, who could overhear the back booth from the grill. Hear anything about your dog? Coot wanted to know. He dipped his toast in the poached egg. Not a word. I don't think you're going to. Is that right? If it was anybody around here that stole him, they'd have jumped on that money like a beagle on a rabbit. No, sir, I think that dog's long gone. Percy threw his spatula down and walked over. Let me tell you something, Buddy Roe. You say one more word to the father about that dog being long gone, and you're the one's going to be long gone, you hear? You don't have to get to bed out of shape, said Coop. It ain't nothing but a dog. The only fella I ever throwed out of here was Paris Guthrie. I said that'd be the only one, and I wouldn't want to break my promise. Why don't you go over on yonder and sit by the window? Coot got up and without taking his eyes off the owner, without taking his eyes off the owner, and stomped over the table by the window. Don't pay no attention to him, growled Percy. He ain't got a lick of sense. Percy, you didn't have to do that, but I thank you for it. Coot's all right. He didn't mean any harm. Just then, the door opened with some force, and Homeless Hobbs stumbled in on his crutch. Father Tim, he shouted, are you in here? I found your dog. I found Barnabas. The rector bolted from his seat in the booth and stood frozen by the counter. He's way up the hill behind the creek. They had him tied out. I saw him with my own eyes. I went up there to take food to a sick feller. Old Barnabas got a load of me and liked to bark its head off. Some pretty rough characters come out of that house and dragged him inside. How'd he look? I hate to tell you, he looked starved like poor. I'm calling Rodney, said Percy, taking the receiver off the wall phone. I asked around about the jacklegs that's living there. They say they're bad news, drugs or something else low down. One fella said they might be armed. I'd want Rodney to be plenty careful. As a few early lunch customers fixed their mute attention on the unfolding drama, Percy held the phone to Father Tim. He's on the line. Hello, Rodney. Something wonderful has happened. Homeless says he's seen Barnabas at a house up the creek. Yes, yes. A little starved looking, he says. I see. Well, I'll ask him. Can you tell Rodney where the house is? I don't think you can get there from here. I'd have to ride with him to show him. Rodney, he'd have to ride with you. It's up the hill behind the creek. He says he hears they might be armed. Drugs could be involved. Yes, fine. We'll be at the grill. Anybody wants a donut? Percy said to his customers. It's on the house. He shook hands with Homeless and Rodney. I'll be at home then. The Lord be with you. As the two men left, Percy stared after them. I know old Homeless comes to town Tuesday nights to go through Avis's garbage. 
And that's the only time I ever seen him in broad daylight. It was nearly three o'clock before he saw the police car pull up at the curb, and he was standing at the door as Rodney came up the walk. He saw at once that the mission had not been successful. Nothing, said the police chief. We got so darn lost trying to find the way in there. Homeless had walked in before, and when we finally come up on that house, it was tight as a drum. Nobody at home, no dog barking, nothing. I hated to come tell you. Rodney stood with one foot on the top step, looking downcast. Well, then, we seen two old vehicles on the place, a car under a tarp and a van they'd kind of pushed off in the bushes. Did you look at the license plate on the car? I did. Wrote it down on my report. Hang on, he said, going back to the curb and taking a clipboard from the front seat. He walked back to the porch stoop, slowly looking at the report. Let's see here. VAT 7841. That's it. That was on the license plate of the car that took Barnabas. I forgot all about it till this very moment. VAT. Well, all I can do is keep an eye on the place. I'll send Jojo back in the evening again tomorrow. We'll turn up something. Since you had him more than three days, state law says you own him. So they've kidnapped him, pure and simple. And it looks like abuse into the bargain. They don't have a snowball's chance. He felt torn between elation and disappointment. Thank you, my friend. Keep me posted. He went into the study and sat on the sofa, feeling a desperate fatigue. He also felt an aching thirst again, which he knew was a warning, but he was too tired to get off the sofa and get a glass of water. In a minute, he murmured aloud, leaning his head back. I'll do it in a minute. On Saturday evening, the phone rang. Father Tim, it's me, Jojo. Jojo. I went over there and looked around, but I didn't find anything. Tried knocking on a few doors along the road, but all I could scare up was an old woman and two kids, and they didn't know much. It's spooky back in there. That's where all the liquor used to be made. But don't you worry. I'm going again tomorrow, right after church. Church? He'd completely forgotten the crooks of his sermon. Thank you, Jojo. God bless you, he said, going at once to his desk. There it was. Tough times, tender hearts, typed rather more neatly than usual, and appearing to be in good order. He turned out the lights and went upstairs. A good night's sleep and the press of Sunday off his shoulders, and he'd be as good as new. Next week, maybe he'd ask Cynthia to go to a movie. Nothing, said Rodney, when he called after church. Jojo went up there and came back empty-handed. Cars hadn't been moved, and there was no sign of a dog except a few piles of poop under a tree. I guess where they'd tied him up. I tell you what, my instincts got to working on this, and Tuesday, I'm going to stake a man out in the woods around there. Maybe us prowling around in a police car has run him off. Hmm. Maybe us prowling around in a police car has run him off. But anyway, I smell a rat. Smelling rats is your job, and you're mighty good at it. Remember how you jumped on that candy wrapper? You got to look for the little things, Rodney said, with dignified authority. He had no sooner put the phone on the hook than it rang again. You coming out here today? Dooley. Well, no, no, I'm not. Not today. I thought you might be coming out. I want to get out next Sunday, but not today. We've had lots of excitement. We think we may have found Barnabas. You ain't. Oh, I think we have. We'll see. Rodney's going to stake a man out in the woods to observe the place. It's up on the hill above the creek. Homeless carried food to somebody up there and saw him. Barnabas barked at him, he said. That's super, said Dooney. That's great. I'll keep you posted. Doing all right, are you? Yep, but Rebecca Jane sleeps all the time, looks like. I done played with them old dogs and rolled that old horse and all. Well, let's keep in touch. You doing what we asked, what we talked about? I forgot to change my underwear last night. Well, then, tonight you get another chance. Tell Grandpa, hey, I will. Tell Cynthia, hey, and old Violet and Jack and all. Oh, I will. Well, bye, said Dooley, hanging up. With a warm rush of feeling, he realized that Dooley Barla was homesick. He was getting ready to take a hot shower when the phone rang by his bed. Father, his doctor's voice told him the whole story. She's through with it. Everything looks good. She's resting. Leo Baldwin is a master. Thank God for Leo. They washed up at eight o'clock last night. I would have called you earlier, but I couldn't. I dropped down on a bed in Leo's office, and I was out of here. Today has been hectic. This, his voice broke slightly, this is a great answer to prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you. He'd never heard his friend sound this way, and he was swept up in the joy of it. Tell me everything if you have the strength. 
We took the copter to Charlotte, put her on a Lear, and flew to Boston. An ambulance was waiting. We were at Mass General in a little under three hours. The donor was a boy, 18 years old. Motorcycle, no helmet, closed head injury, rotten business. They had him, hooked him up to a respirator at the scene, brought him in, did brain scans. There was no blood flow to the brain. The emergency room doctor called Leo. Leo talked to the parents. They consented, and Leo called me. What an uncanny, unbelievable miracle. Thousands to one, you know. Hoppy was silent for a moment and cleared his throat. She'll be at mass till we find out whether she's rejecting. Probably a couple of weeks. Then Leo wants her here in Boston for four to six months. That's the bad. Hmm. That's the bad news. I'll fly up whenever I can. Thank God for Wilson. I got him in the nick of time. God's timing is always perfect. I'm beginning to see that, even about Carol. Get the names of the parents who gave their consent. I'd like to pray for them. I'll do that. When are you coming home? In the morning, the old red-eye special. Wilson has probably croaked by now, but he's, but he's young. He can handle it. Keep those prayers coming, pal. Consider it done, he said. Knowing that was one prescription, he would not forget to refill. And we'll end it there for tonight. We're on page 350, starting chapter 21. Thanks for tuning in. Stay safe, stay healthy. See you tomorrow.